Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome back after a few week hiatus to uh, science and technology Q&A for kids and others. I was off for a few weeks here because we are doing our annual uh, autumn summer school and uh, high school summer camp. Uh, lots of interesting projects, lots of interesting students, and uh, lots of fun for me, lots of opportunity to learn about new things, not only for the students, but also for me. Um, anyway, we're back now, and I'm um, happy to try and take questions about uh, any kind of aspect of science and technology, see whether I can answer them. Uh, I'd like to remind people that there's a big archive now that's been building up of uh, the last, well, basically two years of um, uh, Q&As. They should be pretty nicely indexed and uh, pretty easy to find different kinds of questions in. I'm trying to kind of avoid answering the same question too many times here. Um, and uh, although I certainly don't remember where everything is, uh, sort of referring people to things I've talked about before. So let's see, we have a bunch of questions that got saved up here. Um, the, uh, we have a new one that just, um, um, All right, let's see. Maybe I'll I'll jump into this new one from Vass asking, what does the concept of the Rouliad say about teleportation? Okay, that's not so simple, but uh let's let's see where we can go with this. So what does teleportation mean? So usually when things move, if I move, if I walk, if I move from here to somewhere else, I am one place now, and then I go through all the intermediate places to get to the place I'm going to. In other words, what doesn't it doesn't happen that I'm in my first place and then I just disappear and then I rematerialize in the place I'm going to. In you know the Star Trek science fiction television series from the 1960s, there was this concept of, of a transporter where somebody would step onto this uh, kind of pad and they would kind of uh, be disintegrated, and then they would reappear on a pad somewhere else, or actually not always a pad, just they would reappear somewhere else, having been reconstituted. That's, for material objects like people, for example, that's not how things currently can be made to work. If you want to go from here to there, you've got to be at every intermediate place in going from one place to the other. Now, it's a little trickier, because imagine that you wanted to take something like a um, a plastic dinosaur figurine, and you wanted to transport that to somewhere else. Well, one thing you could do is put it in a 3D scanner, have it have a digital representation of that dinosaur figurine created, take that digital representation, send it as in some electronic or or optical form to another place where you've got a 3D printer, and then you print the dinosaur again. And it's as if you had, you teleported the dinosaur from where it was to where it's going without it ever existing in the intermediate places, because it only existed in digital form as sort of a 3D geometry description of how the dinosaur should be reconstituted. So in a sense, one kind of practical version of, of sort of teleportation is you take the object, you kind of analyze what it's like. Maybe you analyze it destructively. Maybe you destroy it. Maybe you just take it apart atom by atom. You might use, let's say, a, a, I don't know, an, a, an atomic force microscope or something to like pick off atom by atom the original object. Then you have a representation of where all the atoms are. You send that in digital form to another place and then you reassemble it in the, in the place it, it ended up. Now, nobody knows how to do that right now. Uh, there are an awful lot of atoms in a person, let's say. There are on the order of, well, uh, a one with maybe 27 zeros after it. So a trillion, trillion, billion, billion, trillion, trillion atoms or something in a person. And turning that into kind of digital information, sending it and so on, far beyond what current technology can do. But that's sort of one concept of how you might 
sort of go from one place to another without being in the intermediate places. Now, that's the, there's another form of teleportation which uh, people talk about, which comes from quantum mechanics. So this, this gets pretty tricky and is very deeply informed by things that we figured out very, very recently. Uh, well, in some cases, just in the last couple of years, in other cases, in the matter of the last uh, few months or weeks about kind of how quantum mechanics works. So let's see if I can describe a little bit the, the idea of this. So first point to realize is that in sort of standard classical physics, in the kind of physics that got sort of initiated in the 1600s with Newton and people like that, there are equations of motion that describe how things move. So for example, you throw something, it moves in this parabolic trajectory, and there's an equation that says at every moment, there's a certain uh, acceleration, a certain force on the object due to gravity that will, and there's a certain initial velocity, and you have an equation that says exactly how the thing will move. And it's a, a definite equation that describes a definite trajectory that the thing should follow. That's how sort of classical physics works. Big idea of about a hundred years ago now is uh, what's, what's called modern physics, although eventually that term modern of modern physics will have to be retired. Um, I, I like to think that um, um, what we've done in the last couple of years with our physics project is kind of the next big stage of the description of physics. And I think it needs a name. Maybe somebody can suggest a name. You know, there are all these textbooks of modern physics, but there will eventually be textbooks of the physics we invented in the last few years. And I don't know what they'll be called. Um, I don't think they should be called postmodern physics. Um, but uh, uh, that's, that's kind of a, a challenge of naming there. But in any case, in so-called modern physics, which is actually 100 years old, um, the, uh, uh, the key idea is this idea of quantum mechanics. And <clears throat> the notion, so it's, it's all a little bit confusing in terms of naming, because the reason it got called quantum mechanics is because things that people thought were continuous ended up being broken into quantized discrete pieces. So for example, big idea from uh, Max Planck and Albert Einstein from around 1900 to 1905-ish timeframe was the idea that light is not just a continuous uh, sort of flow of electromagnetic energy, it is broken into discrete quanta, which, which we call photons. That's the quantization of, um, uh, of the electromagnetic field. Well, uh, the, the general belief was lots of things are quantized, are discrete. And that's sort of one of the features of quantum mechanics. But it's in the end, it's probably not the most important feature of quantum mechanics. Um, the, uh, one of the confusing things is that that time, people thought space and time might also be quantized, but they couldn't figure out how to make that work in terms of the sort of formalism and mathematics of thinking about that. We finally figured that out as part of our physics project in the last couple of years of the idea of how space and time can really be discrete. Um, and yet we get all of the things that we're used to observing about features of space and time and so on. Okay, but back to quantum mechanics. So I think the big idea as we think about quantum mechanics today is that instead of definite things happening, you know, you throw something and it follows a definite trajectory. Instead, there's a whole giant kind of branching, merging collection of possible trajectories. And each of those possible trajectories represents something that sort of could happen. And actually what the idea that is in its most extreme form happens in the Rouliad, um, but in what we call multi-way systems, the idea is that in the universe, everything actually does happen. Many things actually happen. Our experience is that there's a definite thread of time that we imagine we, when we think about our sort of life and times, we normally imagine that, oh, this happened, then this happened, then this happened, not at any given time, all these different things were happening all in parallel. Um, and uh, you know, we think definite things happen in the sort of classical physics kind of way. But in our modern view of these things, we think about multi-way systems where there are many paths of history that are being uh, traced out. So then the big surprise is, if in fact the universe is following many paths of history, why do we think that definite things happen? Well, this is where things get a bit trickier because 
we ourselves are embedded in this multi-way system that is the universe. So just as every aspect of the universe is branching and all these different possible paths of history are happening, that's also happening in our brains. So in a sense, the question of, of how we perceive the universe is a question of how a branching brain perceives a branching universe. So it's a, a, it's a kind of a complicated concept because our brains are, are sort of branching and doing all these different things, but we imagine that definite things happen. So effectively what we're doing is we're conflating, we're, we're, we're converging these different threads of history that our brains are following. We, in our sort of thinking about what's going on, are sort of taking all those different paths of history and considering them to be one path of history. The non-trivial fact is that that doesn't lead to weird inconsistencies in what we think happens in the world. That eventually it will be, even though, okay, and this is where, again, it gets tricky, even though there are effects that we say that's a quantum effect where, where it does matter that there are multiple paths of history at any given time, on a large scale, in terms of our sort of everyday experience, it is consistent to just assume that all these paths of history are really saying the same thing. Now, again, it gets even trickier here because different human minds, different people in different places, different whatever, they can have a different perception of what happens in the universe. Their internal perception of what happens in the universe, we know it more or less agrees person to person. You say, you know, we're sitting in the same room. What's happening here? People will give more or less the same description of what's happening. But internal to their brains, the actual pattern of neural firings that is the, their internal description of what's happening in that room will be different between those different people. There's just a sort of a common understanding, a kind of coarse-grained level of understanding that seems the same. But so sort of a critical idea is this idea that even though the universe is branching in all these different ways, we sort of imagine a definite thing is happening because we conflate all those branches together when we imagine how we experience things. Sort of the analogy to that in a diff slightly different domain is if we think about, oh, we've just got uh, you know, air in this room. Well, we don't really have air in this room. We have a gazillion different individual molecules that are bouncing around. We just describe that in this sort of large scale uh, way as just a bunch of gas that is that we call air. Um, but the idea that we can just experience all those molecules bouncing around as that overall gas that's a consequence of the fact that we're pretty big compared to the individual gas molecules, and we're kind of aggregating the effects of all those individual gas molecules to say it just performs like this, this sort of large-scale continuum gas. Now, in the case of quantum mechanics, what's going on is that we are aggregating all these little threads of history that are like all the little molecules bouncing around, but they're actual threads of history rather than just molecules or something, but we're aggregating all those threads of history and, and, and we're concluding that there's sort of a bulk thing that happens in more or less the same way that we conclude that there's a bulk thing that happens in the air, even though the air is made of all those discrete molecules. Okay, so what does this have to do with teleportation? All right, so when you look at these different threads of history, at any given time in sort of, you, you can say, let me, let me find a description of the universe at this moment in time. The description of the universe will have many threads of history in it. There will be many distinct threads. If you want to find how precisely the precise state of the universe, there are many possible precise states of the universe on all of these different threads. Okay, point number one. Point number two, it's also the case that when we say, what's the state of the universe? We are describing, um, uh, there's also different places in space in the universe. And when we say, what's the current state of the universe, it's tricky to know what, okay, so the, let, let me describe it this way. So let's say the star nearest to ours, uh, other than the, the nearest to the sun, Alpha Centauri, let's say there's some uh, tremendous thing that happens. Alpha Centauri blows up. It's not, not really going to happen for um, a very long time, if ever, I think. Um, but let's say something something happens. Maybe there was a Maybe there's, let's say there's an alien civilization that lives on a planet near Alpha Centauri, and they suddenly uh, decide to launch a big ad campaign, and they've got this giant unfurling 
huge ad that says, you know, uh, you know, buy Alpha Centauri cookies or something. And, and they do that at some moment, okay? That star is four light years away from us. So the moment where they unfurl their giant cookie ad, we won't see the effect of that for four years because that's how long it takes light to go from that star to us. But if they said, well, when did you unfurl the giant cookie ad? Was it at 12 noon on January 1st of this year? Well, uh, what do we say? Did we receive it on 12 noon, January 1st of that year? Did they have their own calendar running? And they said, oh, it was January 1st. But of course, that's not the same January 1st. That we, there's no conversion from their January 1st to our January 1st, because there's a four-year delay in sending the light signal from one to another. So it becomes sort of an arbitrary thing, whether you synchronize their calendar to be how you synchronize their calendar with our calendar. So this leads to the idea of reference frames and the idea of foliations of space-time and this whole notion of how simultaneity works and the arbitrariness with which you can choose kind of where their calendar is relative to our calendar. So that's sort of another, uh, it's all a bit complicated actually. The, so, so there's this kind of way of choosing different notions of simultaneity in physical space. The same is true across these different threads of history in what we call branchial space, the space of different quantum branches. All those different threads are different quantum branches. And you can imagine all those threads being kind of laid out in something that is like physical space, but it isn't physical space. Two threads can be considered to be nearby if they have a common ancestor uh, soon before them. So in other words, if two different threads came from a branching of one event, one, one state earlier on, one state just, just very recently, then those two threads are considered to be still nearby. And so from that, you can build up this notion of branchial space, and you end up with a this idea of different foliations of branchial space, different ways to define simultaneity, not now across different places in space, but across different threads of history in the universe, across different places in branchial space. Okay, how does all of this relate to teleportation, I say again? So the issue is to say that something is moving in, gosh, how to talk about this. So, okay. So what happens is in these different branches of history, one can say that the histories of the universe are entangled because those different branches of history are related to each other. They were those two branches, they might have shared a common ancestor. So there was a, a state of the universe and then it branched into two possible states of the universe and so on. That leads to those states of the universe being what we could say are entangled. They're correlated with each other because they both came from the same initial state. So one thing that one can then think about is given that different states of the universe are entangled from common ancestry, how do you, what you, you can have states of the universe that are, now again, I, 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 have to, I have to break this down a little bit further and it's, it's going to get a bit complicated here because we have to start talking about not only states of the whole universe, but also states of different parts of space in the universe. But let me say very roughly that what you can see happening is at different places, at, for di in different threads of history, some object might be at different places in physical space. And the fact that these two threads of history are both kind of have a, a common ancestor, a recent common ancestor, it's like those two threads of history are related to each other. They're entangled because they had common ancestry. Yet this object is in a different place in one of these uh, states than it is in another of these states. So now what's tricky is to say, so, so in, but, but now if, if we are perceiving what's going on, we have this weird situation where it looks to us, if we were to conflate those two states of the universe, it would seem like this object is in two different places. We, we would be confused. Where is this object? It, you know, we, we are conflating together states of the universe where in one version, the object is in one place and another version, the object is in the other place. And we're imagining in our minds 
that those two states of the universe can be considered the same for purposes of our sort of single thread of experience. And so that will tend to confuse us because it looks like the object is in two places at once. Okay, but I mentioned that you can sort of slice branchial space differently. You can make a different sort of, uh, you can say what is simultaneity in branchial space differently, just like you can do that in physical space. How do you, in, in physical space, it's just this sort of arbitrary choice of, oh, I'm gonna set the clock to be, uh, you know, in Alpha Centauri to be this way, and I'm gonna set the clock here to be this way and so on. But it's, well, let's see. Um, for example, in physical space, if you're moving through physical space, there is sort of a natural way to set these clocks that uh, corresponds to a certain state of motion that you have. And if you change your state of motion, the sort of the, the way you set these clocks, the sort of natural way to set these clocks will differ. So you can effectively choose a different natural way to describe simultaneity in the universe by going at a different speed relative to uh, a different speed in, in the universe. Well, something similar happens in branchial space. We don't understand it as well, but there's something like going at a different speed in branchial space, basically having a different choice of simultaneity in branchial space. And those different choices, so when you have different choices of simultaneity, that object that I said in one branch of history was in one place, in another branch of history was in another place, in those different uh, ways of, of foliating branchial space effectively, those different sort of uh, perceptions of how you put together those different branches of history, you will have a different conclusion about where the object is. And so that can lead to an effect that seems like teleportation because you can, if you change your point of view about what's going on, which seems like an internal thing for you to do, it'll be as if the object moves from this place to that place. And it's sort of all on you in the way that you're doing what people would say in sort of more traditional physics is kind of the way you're doing the quantum measurements and so on will cause the object to be in one place versus another place. But it's not really something which you can harvest because to do that, you kind of have to, you're, you're sort of changing the way your brain is set up. And if you change the way your brain is set up, it's like, you know, you're almost putting, you know, the object is moving because first you had your hand over one eye and then over the other eye. And yes, the object seems to move. It's kind of something more like that than it is the idea that the thing sort of materially moves from one place to another. So the, um, so that's kind of the, the sort of, there's this branchial form of, of, um, of motion. There's this form of motion that just comes from taking a different point of view about branchial space, um, which is sort of not real motion, probably. Of course, it depends because it is real motion if for other reasons, so to speak, you're sort of changing your, your way of sampling branchial space, then it might seem like real motion to you. But it, it's not something where you can say, it's something where the motion is sort of in the eye of the beholder. Now, again, it's quite complicated because you could say the same thing about motion in physical space relative to the way that you foliate physical space. Um, and, and you'd be right to say that because if, if you know, the thing isn't moving, you say, is it moving in space? Well, I'm right next to it and I'm moving with it. Well, then it doesn't seem to be moving. And so you have the same issue there, but uh, we're more familiar with the notion that it's moving and then we're stationary, we're not moving, et cetera. We don't yet understand very well this idea of kind of motion in branchial space. So it, it's a little bit more mysterious what's, what's going on there. Now, I could say another thing as well, which is about the kind of the earlier form of teleportation that I described, where you, you take a thing, you kind of deconstruct it into pure digital information, then you reconstruct it somewhere else. Okay, well, in our model of physics, everything is pure digital information. The whole structure of the universe is just made up of a, of a giant collection of atoms of existence, atoms of space that have certain relations to each other. That's all there is in the universe. And all of our experiences in the universe are just us having a certain perception of what's going on there. Uh, us built from the same stuff, by the way. So here's the thing. When you imagine a physical object moving from here to there, well, first of all, what is a physical object? 
the whole universe is just made of these atoms of space connected in certain ways. It's this giant network of atoms of space. So a physical object is something which has some degree of persistence through time in that, or, or at least some, some aspect of it has some degree of persistence through time. The analogy that's convenient is to think about a fluid like water and to think about vortices in water, little swirls in the water or in air, you know, a, a tornado or something. A tornado is made of just molecules of air, but there's a certain overall structure, overall uh, way that the air is moving, and that has a certain persistence to it, even though it's made of different molecules of air at every successive moment in time. So similarly, the idea in our model of physics is that everything works that way. So for example, a particle like an electron is just some little region of, of connections in the structure of space that has the feature that it remains that the structure of that collection of connections remains co coherent, consistent through time. And that's why the electron sort of can, can move and not change its character. Even though the electron at every successive moment in time is made of different atoms of space, like the vortex and the fluid, it maintains some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of engram of itself, some kind of uh, trace of itself that is independent of the specific atoms of space of which it's made. So when you say, I'll move a material object through space, what's happening is you're taking the electrons and the quarks and all those kinds of things, and those sort of little vortex-like things that represent those, those things are moving through this kind of fabric that is this hypograph as well, this, 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 this network of connections between atoms of space. So that, that's what, how ordinary motion works. Ordinary motion is a persistent thing, a bit like a vortex, gets to move through the structure of space. Okay, but now, and, and by the way, the, the speed at which it can move through the structure of space is on average, at most, the speed of light. And that's not too hard to eventually to see why that is. Um, it's basically because every little uh, effect of one atom of space on the neighboring atom of space to which it's connected, the, the, um, uh, the, 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 the time, there's a certain elementary time that it takes. Every, every, every update of the structure of the network takes a certain time. And what, what one will say happens is that this network, we can think of the different connections in the network as also being a certain elementary distance apart. And the ratio of the elementary distance to the elementary time is the speed of light. And so in a sense, effects in this, in this very low level network, effects necessarily sort of move at the speed of light. But what's complicated is the structure of space, they move microscopically at the speed of light. But what that means for, for what, they, what happens on a larger scale, for example, that whole electron, it could be that some little tentacle of the electron moves, uh, it, it goes sort of at the speed of light relative to this network, but the whole structure of space might, the, the space is being made up from the same network. And so the question of whether the, the sort of every part of the electron moves at speed of light has to do with how you assess where it's moving, and that depends on the structure of space. So if, for example, there's a little, little special place where there's a little thread in the structure of space where one atom of space is directly connected to an atom of space that otherwise, in most ways of getting to the other atom of space, involves some long path, but there happens to be this little thread of connection between them. That's kind of like a space tunnel it's kind of like a place where two parts of the universe are connected sort of in, in less distance than corresponds to the normal uh, way you would travel from one to the other. So, okay, so then, okay, so let's go back to the teleportation idea. So we've got this electron, it's this big fluffy thing that's like a vortex that's made of lots of atoms of space. But the question is, can you, Let's say you have a tiny space tunnel. Can you squeeze that electron through the tiny space tunnel? Well, no, you, you can't. As such, it's a big fluffy thing that's made of lots of atoms of space. And the space tunnel is like only, let's say, three atoms of space wide or something like this. How do you get it through? Well, you can't as such, as, a, as an electron. But if you could deconstruct that electron into just some pattern of atoms of space that would sort of fit through that space tunnel, 
then you might be able to get the atom of space, get the electron to the other side of the space tunnel and to somewhere different in space, in a sense, more quickly than ordinary motion of that electron would correspond. So the question of can you take apart the electron and turn it into sort of features of the atoms of uh, features of space that can be propagated faster through a space tunnel, that's technology far in our future. Um, and because you know we are we are trillion, trillion, trillion times bigger, at least, no, more trillions, about probably trillion, 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 ten times or something bigger than the atoms of space we are. And sort of the, the most microscopic things we can manipulate are maybe a million trillion times smaller than we are, which is far, far bigger than anything that's down at the level of atoms of space. So we don't have any idea yet how to manipulate things down at the size scale of the atoms of space. Whether, uh, you know, never say never, because it's, uh, uh, you know, if you look at the history of technology, one is continually figuring out sort of engineering solutions that let one leverage pieces of the physical universe in ways that we hadn't expected before. I mean, right now, it's seeming like the only ways you get down to things on the scales of atoms of space might be in very extreme situations with black holes and things like this. But I'm not counting it out that there's a way to do it uh, using things that are more sort of uh, everyday, everyday capabilities. We just don't know how to do that yet. So, so anyway, so that's that's the that's a, the rough idea here. Now, now when it comes, I mean, this is even more extreme when it comes to the Rouliad. So, quantum mechanics is a story of there are many different things that could happen, but in a sense, they're all the um, uh, the same. Uh, it's sort of the same underlying rule that's being applied, but it's being applied in different ways to make these different branches of history. In the Rouliad. One talks about not just a particular rule being applied, but all possible rules, all possible computational programs can be applied. And the Rouliad is the entangled limit of all those possible ways of, of uh, all those possible applications of all those possible programs. So the just like I was saying, you know, we as human observers of branchial space we kind of conflate together regions of branchial space and say definite things happened. So do we do the same thing in Rulial space? We are conflating different small regions of Rulial space where we say, we're assuming the set we can imagine that the same thing happens here. We don't understand all of these things in as much detail as, as one eventually will, but um, sort of the, the, um, this question of what does teleportation look like in Rulial space uh, wow, I haven't really thought about that terribly much. Um, uh, I think this idea, yeah, I mean, it's kind of wild, actually. This um, this idea of kind of quantum teleportation, where you are sort of changing your point of view about the universe to imagine that things are in different places, the same will happen in real space. So in other words, uh, one can imagine different minds, effectively, that operate according to different rules that exist in different places in real space, might actually conclude that things were will can conclude that things are in different places in, for example, physical space. And so, if you were to transition from one mind to another, you might conclude that something was in a different place. So, if you and to make a, a silly way to say it, change your mind. But by change your mind, I really mean, you know, you are changing the structure of your mind, not just you change what you're thinking in your mind, but you change the very structure by which your mind operates. Then I could imagine that the, you can get essentially real teleportation um, in which something effectively moves from one place to another because you've changed your view of the universe which causes you to believe that it's a different place because you're going on a different branch of in, in real space, a different branch of the Rouliad, effectively. So that was a little complicated. I, I, I apologize for the complexity there, but that's some um, a little bit of a, a story about teleportation. I would say that the um, the concept of kind of breaking things down into their underlying sort of elements 
to transport them around, the, the sort of first form of teleportation I described is, um, is something you can also imagine doing in real space where you kind of break down anything into the atoms of existence that it contains, then you essentially reconstitute those atoms of, exist atoms of existence somewhere else. Um, I do imagine that sort of our view of, of how, you, how you move the analog of a particle like an electron that maintains its coherence as it travels from one place in physical space to another, the analog of that in real space is probably rather complicatedly, is probably the idea of concepts. So if you have two minds that operate in different ways, according to different rules, they're effectively in different places in real space. The question is, how do you move something from one mind to another? You know, you can't take a sort of transplant of these are the neural neural firings in one mind and just say, let's take the detailed electrical signals in the in the hundred billion neurons that are in one mind and apply them to the hundred billion neurons that are in another mind. That's not going to work. Instead, you have to have a transport layer that allows you to take some aggregated version of the thoughts of the first mind and transport them to the second mind. And the basic way we do that is through language and through the idea of concepts. A concept is some kind of thing that, you know, the concept of a keyboard or something is a, a, a concept that is sort of the aggregate of lots of individual neuron firings in one mind. And it causes to ingest that concept in another mind causes a lot of other detailed neural firings in, in that mind. But that's a sort of the robust transport layer that goes between one mind and another. More elaborately, this whole idea of computational language, the thing I've spent the last many decades working on, this whole way of sort of, of, of translating from what is a mind level thing, a human mind level thing, to what is a pure computational thing. That's the role of Wolfram language, is to let you write, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, table, uh, you know, uh, X squared, X goes from one to 10 or something, that that is a human level representation, a human understandable representation of a piece of computation, which ultimately will be implemented, ultimately will be implemented down in the Rouliad at the level of atoms of space. Uh, in the intermediate, it is represented by electrons in your computer CPU and all those kinds of things. But the question of sort of how you take that, that the how you take the computation that we imagine in our minds and translate it, the role of Wolfram language is to represent the those aspects of, of possible computations that are ones that humans care about, like tables of X squared and things like this, as opposed to just the unbelievably incoherent kind of characteristics of lots of gazillions of atoms of space or gazillions of atoms of existence, just sort of being updated in some complicated way. It's, it's like saying when we see a vortex in a fluid, for example, we say, oh, look, there's a little eddy in our water. Whereas if we see some complicated piece of turbulence or we were to look down through a very powerful microscope and see all the, or see all the molecules bouncing around, we wouldn't have anything particularly to say about them other than, well, there are a lot of molecules bouncing around. We wouldn't have sort of a collective statement to make. What language, concepts, ultimately computational language, what those represent are the kind of aggregated concepts that we fished out of the underlying sort of detail of what's happening at the level of atoms of existence, what's happening at the level of sort of the lowest level of the Rouliad. So this question of, of what it means to, to move in Rouliad space and what moves in Rouliad space, it's really taking things like concepts, things that can be represented in language, and those are things which we can expect to be robust as we move them across real space. So what would it mean to teleport in real space? It would mean that you take the concepts in your mind, in a mind, and you start somehow moving them, not at the level of, of big concepts that are heavily aggregated, but somehow you move them down at the level of individual, like maybe neuron firings, but much, much lower level than that. But we could just think about it in terms of neuron firings. You are, you are just taking that series of neuron firings and trying to move it to another brain. So let's give an analogy. I think they can see how this might work. So let's say you've got a brain and you've got some, 
uh, you know, neural connection. So you're measuring the electrical impulses in a few nerve cells in your brain. And there you have these spike trains, you know, they make, you know, beep, 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 you know, kinds of things as, as your nerves are firing. You've got all of those beep, 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 beep things happening in some region of your brain. And then you say, let's take that. That's at the level, that's at a very granular level, a very low level. Let's take that beep, 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 beep thing and let's move it to another brain. Well, good luck. You know, that beep, 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 beep thing might represent the, I'm, I want a piece of chocolate, but it's much lower level than the sort of concept level of I want a piece of chocolate. The I want a piece of chocolate level is transportable to another brain. But the beep, 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 beep level at the level of individual neurons is not normally transportable to another brain. But you could imagine some funky system where you encode something that you know, it starts as a concept in your brain, then you record certain detailed beep, beep, beep things from individual neurons, you move those to another brain, you kind of reconstitute the, con the, the concept, not by sort of having it go all the way through your vocal cords, saying something, your auditory system hearing something, not through that transport layer, but instead through some kind of direct neuron to neuron transport layer where it's reconstituted at the other end. Of course, we don't know how to do that right now, um, but it's kind of the idea that, you know, you could imagine, um, uh, you could imagine something where you kind of take the nerve, nerve firings from one person, you kind of, uh, you extract them from one person, you re-implant them in another person, and they give the same idea to that other person. Now, normally that doesn't happen that way, but one could, that would be sort of the teleportation of ideas would be uh, sort of having something like that happen. I'm reminded a chap I, I knew once had this, um, had this thing where he wanted to have sort of direct neural communication with, uh, in that particular case, I think his wife, where he had this implanted uh, thing that measured the, um, uh, in his arm, that measured uh, kind of not quite, I think, uh, measured the, uh, the, the sort of nerve impulses which were making muscles contract. And so, and then, you know, his, his wife or somebody, well, I, some other person, I'm not sure who, had, a, had, a, a, had sort of a copy of this. So in a sense, it's like one person moves their finger and then that is transmitted by, you know, by some radio or Bluetooth or something like this to the other person. That fact is picked up in a sensor in one person's arm and is moved to, through Bluetooth to um, uh, another person's arm. And then it is used as a nerve impulse in the other person's arm. And, um, the, uh, um, and then so that, you know, one person moves their finger and the other person sort of under remote control is, is at least urged to move their finger. There's, there's some impulse in their, in their nerves in their, in their arm that causes that muscle to be, to be moved. So it's kind of like, that's, that's almost like the teleportation of ideas. It's a very low level version of the teleportation um, uh, of, of, of ideas. Let's see, that was a long description here. So let's see, I think there's, there's some lots of questions here. Um, let's see if there are ones that, um, uh, okay, about this physics topic, let me just look at a few of these. Uh, L. LL asks, so he experiences a single state of the universe or he's sampling different branches to build our experience. I, we are sampling different branches to build our experience. But actually, the way we think about it right now, we are sort of making assumptions about this is the same as that to make those branches uh, sort of conflate with each other. I'm not sure that's necessarily the right way to think about it. I think the way you describe it of sampling different branches to build our experience is probably a more accurate way to describe it. Um, from a sort of mathematical point of view, the simplest thing we can do is just say we're building up a set of equations that say this branch is the same as that branch. But I don't think that's necessarily the right way to think about it. I think it may be better to say we're really aggregating these branches to build our experience. So yes, that's, that's right. Um, Okay, so there's a question here uh, from um, Aaron. If the speed of light emerges from propagation through discrete eames, then does the speed of light vary slightly 
Could this be experimentally validated? Okay, so even in traditional physics, uh, well, let's see. Depends what you mean by the speed of light. Uh, you know, in a black hole, a photon is pulled so much back by gravity that it doesn't move out from the black hole. So in a sense, you could describe that as saying the speed of light is zero at a black hole because light is pulled back to be stationary. But in fact, the usual way one describes things in terms of the causal relationships between one event and another, you still imagine, you say the speed of light is what the speed of light always is. It's just that space has been distorted to the point where even though light's running at the all, you know, as going as 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 fast as it normally would, space has been so distorted that even going at that speed, it doesn't get anywhere. So, in a sense, there's sort of a trade-off between the distortion of space, describing things in terms of the distortion of space and describing things in terms of a change in the speed of light. But it gets even more complicated in our models of space-time because you can change the dimension of space as well as changing the uh, uh, the curvature, the the kind of um, the, the distances within space. So I think it's the case that um, uh, you can parameterize, you can describe, at least in a first approximation, changes in dimension that might happen in the early universe and places like that as a variation in the speed of light. And what you will see experimentally, you could describe the presence of, uh, you know, even in traditional physics, you could describe the presence of gravity as leading to a change of the speed of light. It's not the way it's usually described, but you could talk about things that way. Um, and so similarly, just like when, when light bends as it goes around the sun, but as a result of the effect of gravity, you can think about that as being a, a like what happens when light goes into water, it changes its speed as it goes into water, and you know it it, it bends the the um, you know the stick looks bent in the water. It's it's the same sort of thing. It's just usually talked about in a different way in terms of space time. But um, uh, yes, so I think that the the um, uh, in a sense, whenever there's gravity, you can think about it as being sort of like a change in the speed of light. But now we have this additional thing of dimension change, which is even more like that. And so yes, there are probably experimental consequences of this, and whether. The fact that space-time is not is not uniform; that there's it's sort of lumpy, and uh, things can propagate. You know, things are not just sort of mo smoothly moving through space; they're moving through space, sort of one atom of space at a time. But usually, those atoms of space are so tiny that it doesn't matter. It's just like you know, on your screen, you can see a little Pac-Man that's moving around on your screen. Maybe actually, that's a bad example because it's usually done in very low-resolution graphics. But if you zoom out. You can see this picture of a, you know, your sort of uh, virtual squid moving around on the screen, and it might look like it's continuously moving around, even though you know that really it's moving from one pixel to another to another. But it looks as if it's moving continuously, and, and so it is with with um, uh, with things in these at the level of atoms of space. Now, can you be in a situation where sort of space has been so pulled apart that it's really a big jump from one place in space to another? That may happen near rapidly rotating black holes, and maybe it happens in some other places as well. But yes, in those kinds of places, the structure of space may have been so pulled apart that in a sense, the distance between the atoms of space is large. And so you can potentially see effects. The most likely effect there is that gravitational waves that are produced by such a system uh, will have little gravitational waves, just like light waves. You know, you can think of light as a wave, you can also think about it as a stream of photons. So similarly, you can think about a gravitational wave either as a wave or as a stream of gravitons. And there are even things lower level than gravitons that are essentially distortions in the structure of space. Gravitons are, in a sense, sort of a way of describing distortions in the structure of space that are quite big. Gravitational wave is an even bigger, tends to be an even bigger description of things. Um, but there are much more microscopic descriptions which happen down at the level of atoms of space. Just like when you say the, the velocity of a fluid changes 
you're saying the average velocity of the fluid on a macroscopic scale changes, but down the level of individual molecules, all kinds of other changes might be happening. So uh, let's see, I was, I was just describing um, the, uh, yeah, so there may be places where sort of space has been pulled apart enough that when gravitational waves are produced, they will have little jitters in them that are a reflection of the fact that the space that where they are produced was not something that was continuous. It was something that had been sort of pulled apart into discrete atoms of space. We don't know how big that effect is, whether it will be measurable, whether it will be measurable anytime soon. We don't know that yet. And there's probably a certain degree of cleverness in sort of finding ways to amplify that effect. Uh, for example, one project done at the summer school looked at gravitational lensing. So when, when light, a, a, a lens made of glass, for example, works from the fact that light rays that go into the lens are bent because the speed of light in the in the glass is maybe one and a half times slower than the speed of light in vacuum. And so this, this sort of front of light that goes in will be bent. And that allows the lens to like form an image, you know, do whatever lenses do. So you're looking through a lens rather than looking directly at, at light rays coming to you. Okay, so gravity bends light as well. And, uh, and so when you have like a galaxy or something or, or a black hole even, you can, uh, let's say a black hole, the, the light that goes, that sort of comes around the different sides of the black hole, it's bent. And the light is, tends to be focused just like a lens, a uh, converging lens will, will focus parallel rays of light, will, will bring them to a focus. So if you take a magnifying glass and you're looking at light from the sun, you can use that to make a bright spot and you know burn a piece of paper or something on a, on a bright day because all those rays of light that come to all parts of the magnifying glass are all being focused together to that one point where you put more, much more energy so you can burn the piece of paper. So similarly, you can have instead of the magnifying glass, you have a black hole and light is coming on the two sides of the black hole and all the sides of the black hole and it will be, uh, it will be deflected by the gravity of the black hole and so it will be made to converge. And so what we actually see, and there are lovely pictures of this, is gravitational lensing, typically around galaxies, um, where things from distant places will be that their, their light will be distorted like this. So it's conceivable, somebody worked out something at the summer school about how gravitational lensing works in our models of, of physics and space-time. And I think it's conceivable that there might be some kind of weird sort of scintillation effect where, you, where you're seeing an object that is behind gravitational lensing that happens because of the microscopic structure of space, that that might be an observable effect. And it might be that, that with long enough sort of baseline of how, how far you go from the gravitational lensing event, that you might be able to see a, a measurable effect there. You might be able to essentially see a microscope, have a microscope that sees all the way down to the level of atoms of space. But I don't know if that will work yet. Um, okay. Richard has commented, I've listened to the live neurons in a lab amplified to make audible. It's a strange experience. Yeah, I've, I've listened to those too. I mean, usually what happens is neurons are quite quiescent. Maybe they're going boop, boop, every so often. And then the neuron gets excited and it has this boop, 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 boop. I can't do it. You know, much faster, but faster than that. Um, where it's it's suddenly woken up and it's like you know uh, sort of going crazy and and um, uh, sending signals normally to its other neurons or to the electrode that you're using to measure the neuron. And yeah, I think the really weird thing would be if you had some kind of neural device implement implanted in your brain and you're like thinking about things and suddenly some display comes up that says you know that part of your brain just started you know going crazy. And you're, like, you're thinking you have your big macroscopic thoughts and yet something is, you know, in your augmented reality display or something, something is showing you, by the way, there's a thought going on somewhere in your brain. I don't know what that would do for one. I don't know how, how that would feel. I mean, the, the closest analog of that is, is neurofeedback where you're looking at the EEG, which is kind of the large scale electrical effects on the brain. And you put a bunch of electrodes on your head and um, you can, uh, you know, by the time the electrical signals have gotten through your skull and things like this, they're pretty, they're pretty smooshed out, they're pretty smeared out.
but nevertheless, you can get some sense of, uh, of the overall electrical activity of your brain. So for example, if you fall asleep, the electrical, the pattern of electrical activity will change completely. What do you get? You get, normally you have this thing called the alpha rhythm, which is kind of a, about a nine, uh, about 10 cycles per second of um, uh, the, your brain has kind of a large scale uh, eff effect where it's sort of electrically uh, cycling about 10 times a second. That's absolutely pathetic compared to your average computer, which is cycling a billion times a second or a few billion times a second. But but the actual speed of neurons is, is, is faster. It's maybe 100 times faster than that sort of overall collective uh, alpha rhythm in the brain. When you go to sleep, I think it's the theta rhythm that starts up, if I remember correctly. It's just a different pattern of overall excitation in the brain. And so you can detect that. You can also detect some other things that you can localize EEG a bit. And so like there's a motor strip on the top of one's head that is the thing that is the sort of earliest uh, place where signals start developing that will eventually control your muscles and so on, that will eventually be sent down peripheral nerves to your muscles and so on in your fingers or whatever else. So then, but um, uh, let's see. And the, the thing that you can do in, in kind of, um, you can try and train yourself to know what it feels like when your brain is in a certain state, in a, in a certain state as measured by your EEG. And I've, I've tried this a few times, I haven't tried this in years, my gosh. Um, you know, tried this a few times where you're, where you're observing your, your kind of EEG, your very aggregated brain state. And um, uh, then you're kind of trying to learn what it feels like to just sort of let your brain go blank or, or do whatever else. Um, I. Yes, I remember doing this, um, gosh, nearly 20 years ago now, uh, with a, a person who was very big on biofeedback and had invented a bunch of biofeedback technology for trying to, you know, let one sort of learn to relax by by seeing what this what what it felt like to one when one made one's brain uh, have certain EEG, certain brain activities. I mean, of course, you know, it's kind of training one's brain in the same kind of way that you might train your brain to write you know, handwritten letters or something by, in that case, a sort of a feedback loop where you see where your fingers move and your eyes sees where your fingers move, and that becomes the feedback loop to your brain. Whereas EEG is sort of, a, in a sense, a more direct feedback loop of just seeing what your intrinsic brain activity is. I think it would be much more bizarre if you had single cell, single neuron recording in different parts of your brain, and you're like, I'm just thinking about something, and suddenly, as you think about that thing, bing, this particular you know, neuron says, I just woke up. You know, you're thinking about um, elephants. Oh, this neuron here woke up. Oh, you're thinking about rhinoceroses. This neuron here lit up. Very strange experience, I think that would be. Uh, we're not quite there yet. But the closest analog of that is, is fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, where you have to be in this big magnets and things, and you can measure uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the basically the flow of power in your brain, the amount of, uh, of oxygen that's being used, the amount of glucose that's being consumed in your brain. And when, when one part of your brain is active, the neurons are spiking more, they're generating more electrical signals. And as they generate more electrical signals, they need more, uh, they need more fuel and their fuel is glucose and their and metabolism and so on. And so you can detect that effect with, with fMRI, but it's a pretty smeared out thing. It's not, it's not like, it's not like individual neurons. Oh, this particular neuron lit up when you thought about a rhinoceros or something, but it'll suddenly be a strange thing. If you can have, you know, you're just sitting here thinking and suddenly there's this sort of uh, feedback of, of, uh, of, of all these different neurons that were involved. Uh, let's see. Um, Richard comments, it would be the ultimate biofeedback experience to visually see one's own neural activation spatially. Yeah, to really, really see in real time kind of different parts of your brain lighting up and not. I mean, that would be, yeah, it would be very interesting and bizarre. I mean, as I'm you know, yakking at you right now, there could be a little icon of a little brain icon in the corner and where it's like, um, uh, you know, like I know I have this figured out and some piece of the frontal cortex will light up or something, or 
I'm not sure what's what to, you know, what to say next. And some piece of some other lobe of the brain would light up in one's kind of telemetry display of what's happening in one's brain. That'd be a very weird experience. And I think it's some, you know, it reminds me of things where you're trying to measure other kinds of aspects of, of, of us. Like, for example, I tried ages ago a thing which measures the um, uh, kind of, um, let's see, the galvanic spits, um, galvanic skin resistance, galvanic resistance, I guess it's called. So that's your, if you put electrodes across, across your skin, if, if you sweat at all, then much more electricity is conducted than if you don't sweat at all. And so you can kind of measure, uh, you can measure the extent to which you are micro sweating, so to speak, by this change of a galvanic skin res resistance response. Galvanics, yeah, it, it's a resistance anyway. It's a resistance to electrical, uh, uh, to electricity. So, you know, I remember I tried once one of these little devices which measures that, and um, I was at some event and I was, uh, uh, somebody was talking about something or another, there's some sort of semi-public kind of thing. And I was about to put my hand up and, and ask some question. And um, I noticed that this galvanic skin response thing uh, started spiking and it's like, okay, I'm, you know, it is a higher stress to me to put my hand up and ask a question than it is just to sit there and do nothing. And this was a sort of precursor signal of that, that you could see in galvanic skin response. And I think that, um, you know, there are these rather, rather hokey kind of technological ideas of kind of lie detectors and so on, which, um, uh, which is supposed to say, you know, are you, are you feeling stressed when asked this question that work by using similar kinds of techniques? But it's sort of interesting to see that um, uh, that that some things about your brain that you're not necessarily conscious of um, are are measurable in that kind of way, even quite externally, like in skin response. I I have to say that um, I got one of those devices, and one of my kids, who's a pretty cool cucumber, I would say, um, is uh, uh, was trying to see, you know, could he could he you know detect things with the galvanic skin response thing. And he tried all kinds of stuff and he couldn't get it to move at all. And, you know, he tried watching, you know, a, a dramatic movie. He tried doing all kinds of things and it was just flatline. So um, uh, he's, uh, he's uh, uh, perhaps cooler than I am, I suppose. Um, anyway, so I need to go in a few moments here, but uh, maybe I can just... Um, uh, a question here from LL. Would there be, in theory, a way to measure your relative position in real space? That's sort of an interesting question. I mean, the, you know, my view of positions in real space is they have different ways of describing the universe. And they are sort of the, where different minds are in different places in real space. So for example, you know, I'm where I am. Somebody who thinks about things in a similar way to me is kind of fairly close. Uh, you know, the um, a random cat, for example, is probably further away in real space. There are certain kinds of things that I can recognize in the cat that are, you know, similar to me. You know, the cat wags its tail or purrs or whatever else. That's an emotional response that I can sort of recognize as being aligned with an emotional response that I might have. I can go further away than the cat. But I mean, you know, when I think about sort of the nature of physics, I have no idea what the what the transport of that into the cat brain is. When we go further away than that, and we start saying, you know, how does, what is the sort of rural space associated with, I don't know, a colony of bacteria or, you know, the weather or something like that. That translation, that one has the sense that that's much further away in rural space. That the translation from our mind to the mind of the weather or to the mind of our immune system, or to the mind of a bacterial colony, one has the sense that that's a much larger distance in real space. But quantifying that is a super interesting thing to do, because we, we can do it at a much more theoretical level. We can think about, we've got an idealized model of computation, like a Turing machine here. We've got another idealized model of computation. Maybe we've got the actual CPU of our computer over here. These are, again, at different places in real space. But there, we actually know the programs that allow you to effectively be transfer be transported from one to another. 
And so we can measure things like the length of the program that's necessary to translate from the direct sort of inputs that will be used for the Turing machine to the inputs that will be used for your CPU or vice versa. And somehow maybe the length of that program gives one some sense of distance in real space. But these are all things that, that still need to be really worked out. Um, let's see. Uh, well, I think, um, yeah, there are a lot of, lot of interesting questions here. Uh, Well, Eggy is asking, okay, I'll, maybe I'll try and take this one just for a second and I should, should go. It's asking, how do new concepts get created and integrated into the mind of humanity? What makes them robust over a thousand years? Yeah, interesting question. Um, there are ideas like the idea of having an abstract description of the world, the idea of language, the idea of computation, these ideas, once they are ingested into human society, become very robust. There are other ideas like particular concepts in the mathematics of the Babylonians, the idea of loons, the idea of, uh, I don't know, uh, some, the tetractus of, of Pythagoras. There are other ideas that don't really make it. And it's sort of a little bit perhaps like biological evolution there are creatures that are somehow are going to make it and are going to get big, uh, get big in the sense that there are lots of them and they and they have survived for a long time. There are other creatures that get sort of stomped out. And what determines, uh, you know, sort of what gets big and what doesn't seems to be hard to tell. I think in the case of, of ideas, so an interesting question is, will there be more big ideas or will the presence is the number of big ideas that brains can deal with, somehow limited. And as a new idea comes along, it has to be kind of subsumed in other ideas. It's kind of like, you know, you might say in modern times, there's just so much more to know than there was in the Middle Ages, let's say. That's why we need more years of schooling. You could say that. You could say sort of as we've learned more about science and society and this and that and the other there's just you know people should go to school for many more years because there's so much more to learn but actually there's another effect which is some things that people learnt as oh you learn uh, all the different kinds of um oh i don't know all the different uh, forms of logical argument or something now we can subsume all of that by just giving some principles of logic that let you derive all of those logical arguments. It's not the best example. One could say, you know, might have individually learnt the um, uh, all these different kinds of creatures that hang out in a in your average, uh, I don't know, average puddle or something like this. But but in fact, through better understanding of biology, we know oh, there are microorganisms, there are algae, there are uh, you know, there are insects, there are this, that, and the other. We've managed to bucket those things together. So we only have to learn about insects sort of in aggregate once rather than saying, oh, there's the this kind, the that kind, the that kind. So as knowledge progresses, there is both more that's known, but there's also a higher level of abstraction about the knowledge that's already there. So it's possible to kind of learn once, learn one, one principle to cover a large number of what would have been treated as individual facts. So it's not at all evident that just because more has been discovered, that necessarily there's more to learn because some of the, what could, what's been discovered is principles that aggregate together many facts. So this question of what will be the principles and how will the things that we think about today sort of aggregate together into principles is actually very beautiful in our model of physics, which has now spilled over into metamathematics and some other areas. We really see that effect because we see these principles that seem to apply across physics and metamathematics and probably many other areas. And someday in the future, when people name something more than just modern physics, there'll be modern, 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 modern science or something will be this aggregated thing where you learn once 
the principles of multi-computation and concepts like the Rouliad and things like this. And then you get to take that abstraction and apply it in all these different areas rather than learning separately. This is how it works in physics. This is how it works in math. This is how it works in chemistry. This is how it works in these different places. So, you know, I, I fully expect that that will be a, a robust concept, though it may take a while to sort of get to the point where it is presented in a form that is convenient for understanding. See, see what happens is an idea has to be presented in a form that fits into sort of human understanding as human understanding exists today. But once that idea is fully planted, it becomes the basis for the understanding. And it no longer has to be seated, so to speak, in, in sort of existing understanding. It just becomes an understanding in itself. Just like when you first have the concept of a chair, for example, you're always having to explain what a chair is. But eventually, the concept of a chair becomes sort of a a separated thing that you can then explain other things in terms of, you don't have to just kind of go back and explain what it's, what it's based on. All right, I have to um, uh, disappear here to go and uh, do some things for my day job, but um, a pleasure chatting with you guys. And thank you for asking some interesting questions, making some interesting comments. I had a chance to figure out more about the Rouliad here um, for, uh, for those who are interested in these things, we have um, uh, our emerging Wolfram Institute. It is just getting launched now. We'll have a whole uh, area that's studying the Rouliad and studying sort of the from the atoms of existence up from there. And uh, there are uh, lots of ways that are starting to be there to get involved with that. Um, the uh, I will also say uh, just a reminder because I. I said this at the beginning, but I'm going to say it again. You know, I've, I've been doing these uh, Q&As now for a couple of years, and we've accumulated a pretty big library of previous questions. So um, um, I encourage people to check those out. If you feel like it, they've been turned into podcasts and things like that. Um, of course, uh, some of the things that I'll talk about are things that have been around for decades, and they're well-established knowledge related to what I was just saying about the evolution of knowledge. But some of them, including things I talked about today, I um, are, are very new. Some of the things that I talked about today, I figured out in real time as I was talking to you guys, um, and uh, uh, you know that there. And some things are like weeks to months old. So if you look back at earlier things in the um, in our kind of stack of um, of uh, recordings of of these um, uh, of these live streams. Uh, if you if you look for things about the Rouliad, well, there won't be anything about the Rouliad two years ago because I hadn't figured out the Rouliad two years ago. Um, but so things, um, this, is, this is a place where you can actually see things moving forward, I might just say in, in another little pitch. Uh, we do other live streams of kind of working sessions where we're working on both design of the, of the Wharton language, computational language, and also doing things about science. And uh, if you want to know kind of what the front lines of that look like, uh, I encourage you to tune into those things and uh, and check them out. All right. Uh, well, nice to chat with you all and uh, see you another time. Bye for now. <laughs>